So I'd like to kick off this session uh, with a question about innovation and the pace of innovation with new tools like artificial intelligence becoming more rapidly available. And what steps must be in place to ensure that algorithms are trained with the data that represents the whole population, especially in the field of dermatology? So Miriam, I'd like to see if you can answer that question first. Um, sure, thanks for having us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today and discuss uh, the challenges and also the opportunities to bring technology to help our patients and also to be inclusive. Um, the uh, challenge of technology development is that it's happening so fast. I think we are already left behind when it comes to dermatology. If you compare it with the other fields of medicine like PET scan, MRI, fMRI, CT scan, there are many tools that can help our doctors to be better at what they do every day. But when you look at dermatology, unfortunately, it's super archaic uh, and it's very subjective. And uh, we need to have better tools to help with uh, improving outcomes for our patients and also helping our doctors in the front line serving these patients globally. Um, the, uh, I think the lack of digital data when it comes to uh, different skin types uh, is really the problem that is leading to uh, bias in um, building technologies and having tools to help all of our patients in our clinics. Happy to discuss this in more details, but I think it's basically having um, digital tools in these centers that can help first digitize the ecosystem, uh, workflow, gather data, and now expect from our technology tools to be fair when it comes to helping our doctors treat all patients equally and fairly. Thanks. And what are some of the valuable steps that other innovators in the space can learn from uh, Meta Optimize? You all prioritize efforts uh, to improve diverse representation in clinical research. Um, I think having your science hat is really helpful to understand the basics of the tool you are building and also understand where it's going to fail. Where are the biases? Um, I think you need to be the best advocate for your users and patients and doctors when it comes to building tools, engineering tools to help them. So understanding where is the bias, where it's going to where is the lack of enough um, data? And I always say, be fair to the technology. You can expect from the technology what you train, specifically AI, what you train this tool on. You cannot basically just have I don't know 100,000 to 100,000 images from one center or two centers and expect this tool built in this limited data set to work in real life settings. I would say, look at the data do your research, evaluate it in real clinical settings. It is not about published data just in tables of scientific papers. We know these are studies. These have very limited scope. And when you compare it to real life settings, as a scientist, as a computer scientist, so my PhD was in machine learning and computing science, and also I had training in dermatology. Um, so I know it is going to fail if I don't have enough re representation from those cohorts of patients in my data. So this is very, very important to understand from the beginning when you're building your tools and also to be upfront and say, I know my data is not comprehensive in these segments, so I will do risk analysis, I will do risk mitigation, and I will have a proper communication with my users. And now that you have identified the problems, it's all about building partnerships, with our doctors who are really champions in these centers, want to bring technology to life and help their patients, they are more than happy to partner with industry partners and help. So both my science hat and my industry hat basically, um, they, they you know work hand in hand and it's helpful to understand the challenge, uh, the situation, all the failure cases and also build the technology with partnerships and research specifically with the centers who can help you identify and resolve those challenges. Thanks, Miriam. And Dr. Burgess, can you share some thoughts here about the potential harm of inadequate diversity in develop, developing some of these new technologies? Yes, developing some of these technologies have been a little um, skewed in a way. And, and I, I'd like to say when we talk about Fitzpatrick skin type, we're not trying to trying to imply that this stands for racial um you know, uh, ethnic groups, which more often than not, it is used in that 
incorrect manner. What it is used for is the minimal erythema dose. And so if we look at someone who has brown skin, say my skin color or darker, a lot of times they will identify themselves as skin of color, just like Miriam, someone your skin color can still classify themselves as skin of color. So you get the false sense of that there's enough skin of color in your sampling and that you don't understand or realize it's not more stratified into what color skin are you referring to when you say skin type four, five, and six. There's so many different hues in that spectrum. And there is a, a, a mock uh pigment score, which is sometimes used because patients can then identify against this, this classification of 10 different colors and which one are you closest to. So you're not using incorrect data to determine if a person is skin of color. And so that's one of the issues. I think most of the time when they say they have plenty of skin of color in it, it's probably skin type four and it's less than 3%. So it's not even that high when you want to stratify that data. So there's a long way to go in including people of color, of all skin colors, from the darkest to the lightest person. And that's what we're finding is a big issue. Um, and all because some of the sampling and questions you're asking is, are you skin of color? That's it doesn't go any deeper than that. And, and so, Miriam, uh, you know, as you work to bring technologies to the public, working with regulators, can you share any insight into how the FDA uh, prioritizes the importance of diverse representation? What should innovators know when they go to the FDA to try and get a new technology cleared or approved? Um, uh, it's been a great experience, and not only FDA, uh, most of the regulatory bodies that we are working with, with, they actually have this as their mandate. It's all about fairness and being inclusive, and also um, you cannot expect your technology work for only if, if you just talk about Fitzpatrick, for example, three skin types. It means it's going to fail if your user, your doctor, is not good at identifying is it a skin type three or four, right? Because you see it's not going to work for skin type four, and now the user doesn't know what is the skin type. It's not like a um, you know um, well-set guideline, um, fully understood. We don't have been practices. So there are many, many challenges in uh, building tools that can actually work in real life settings, again, in clinical settings. And what we have seen from the FDA and other regulatory bodies is having this mandate to make sure we, uh, we understand and fully understand and identify those challenges. You have risk analysis, you have risk uh, mitigation strategies. And again, basically based on that, you identify, okay, my system doesn't have enough representation from skin type five and six in a skin cancer melanoma data set. Of course, this is challenging because we don't have many patients with darker skin. Um, I mean, skin type five and six with melanoma, but unfortunately there are still patients who die from melanoma with the skin type five and six. So when it comes to the representation of data, it's actually important to say where I have fair contribution of this data in my data set, where is my system validated, what is the clinical performance, and if there's not enough data, that's the reality because we don't have enough really digital information out there about skin type five, six patients, so we need to collect more. Then your mandate is to collect more and your mandate is to have a milestone that you say, we are committing to get to this level by this time. For example, this is one of the strategies that I believe should be in place. Um, the other one is, um, yes, melanoma is relatively rare, but how about other skin problems? General dermatology is not like a skin cancer. You have equally you know, patients, uh, even more patients sometimes for some conditions out there. So you need to make sure you have the right digitization, uh, workflow implementation, data gathering, building tools and data evaluation in place. So we have seen this mandate from all organizations uh, requesting that technology companies either do already have that in place or commit to build it. Um, I think this is probably one of the best moves we can see uh, from regulators. Uh, but the good thing is that it's not um, 
not only it's not ignored, but also uh, it is in a highlight now. Uh, but also, um, actually, I also agree with Dr. Briggs that it's not just to say skin of color. My skin is a skin type four and I'm skin of color, right? But it's different when you look at skin type five, five and six. So we need to be more precise. We need to be uh, basically more um, understanding about the impact of different pigmentation, different skin types, different conditions. And this is not easy. I'm, I'm telling you from technology perspective, uh, different skin conditions will have different representations during the disease life with different skin types, but it has to start from somewhere. And one more point to add, I believe technology will be most helpful in those rare cases. It is not that difficult to identify a BCC or a melanoma in, um, you know, advanced, you know, say melanoma in um, skin type 1 patient. But it's very difficult when it comes to skin type 5 and 6. And that's where we need technology to help with. So those are some of the conversations we've had with different regulatory bodies, including the FDA. And also, um, again, risk analysis and risk mitigation and making sure labeling the tool is um, to the fact, to the truth that our doctors will see in the clinic. So it's not um, underestimating, it's not overestimating the performance. So there, there's helpful. a lot of... Go ahead, Dr. Burgess. I was, I was just saying that there are a lot of issues that come way before we start thinking about artificial intelligence. We have to think about... Um, you know, the the cases, I remember when I was a resident, they they said, you hardly see psoriasis in, in Black patients. And I'm like, really? No, not, that's not true. So one, it's, it's getting more physicians in, of color in the mix. And, and I think that's where you lack maybe the technology or interest, I'm not sure which one it is, but there are plenty of, um, like Howard University is a center of skin of color. There have tons of codochromes and pictures and things like that, because maybe your system won't recognize a pigmented basal cell, which is a common basal cell that we see in skin of color. It can look like a seborrheic keratosis. And more than 50% of our residents today who are training in dermatology do not know how to recognize skin cancers and certain basic um, dermatologic issues in skin of color. And so that's where we need to, to make people more aware is our physicians because they're misdiagnosing. So if they're gonna misdiagnose a case, how are they gonna use AI to substantiate it if there's nothing there to compare it to. So, so it really has to start way back in the chain here in that we have to get our residents up to, to um, date with recognizing and correctly diagnosing skin of color conditions. You have a pool of all that data that goes towards AI. And then you can collectively put all the data together. I think, you know, when we look at the census report in 2018, I think it was 14.6% Blacks or African-Americans or those who identified as that. We're not talking about immigrants or anyone like that, but just Black Americans, African American, which is about 47 million people. And you're telling me we can't get photographs of different conditions in these, you know, individuals, we see, you know, we only have 3% skin of color dermatologists. So we have to start there and getting more dermatologists out there, getting more people into research where we can identify, we have atlases and other photography and images of these conditions, but right now we don't we have probably 1% that we utilize in atlases and things and, and um, other uh, digital images where doctors or residents can go to and say, I wanna look up, like for instance, if you look up beauty, you will see all white images come up. So is that my beauty? 
or what, you know, you can Google anything and you will get a skewed look at what the definition means. So that's where we have to start in order for you to gather all the data to put it into a, some type of a, AI technology. And so I feel like part of this conversation is also a willingness to participate in actual research. And, and Dr. Burgess, I was hoping you could comment on uh, what are some of the, the factors at play for the underrepresentation? You, you mentioned, uh, you know, as certain populations don't even meet their their level in terms of the U.S. demographics. What's at play with this underrepresentation, and what do you think can be done based on some of the conversations you have? Like, what works to encourage people to spend the time to be part of this conversation? Well, I think that um, when we look at the population of Blacks or African Americans in the U.S., it used to be more urban areas. And really, the latest census says that a lot of people are moving towards smaller communities. And so, um, you know, maybe not to Kansas or Oklahoma in the Midwest, but say they used to congregate more in Atlanta. Now it's the suburbs of Atlanta. There's plenty of physicians in these areas who can be recruited to run clinical trials. I think part of the issue are the sponsors or the pharmaceutical industry. Um, they don't cater to skin of color. Um, I can name maybe five researchers in the whole U.S. who are African-American and maybe five Latinos and, and maybe three Asians who are at the top of their game in clinical research. There are not many of us, but one suggestion would be these sponsors to hold forums or hold many, you know, research 101 courses to train more people to become clinical uh, re researchers or principal investigators in their research. Um, right now, I'm conducting a study by a major pharmaceutical company, and it's only involving skin type five and six. Well, the reason is, is because the first time they did it, and it's on TV, it's advertised on TV. And when I tell patients, would you like to enter the, the trial? Everyone is very happy because it's a very expensive biologic that's used for psoriasis. And they just did not include those patients in the studies. And these medications are very expensive and where most average individuals can't afford it. And definitely, if you don't have he health care benefits, you definitely can't afford it. These are patients that are willing and able and will do anything to get in a trial to clear up their psoriasis or what have you. But they may be... Um, medical on medical assistance like Medicaid or sometimes Medicare. And these are the patients that they're not going after or seeking. And that's one of the issues. It's it's who can afford care in this country and who has access. And so maybe to, to round out this conversation, Mary, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences offered a few recommendations uh, to encourage diversity, tax credits for research and development, fast track criteria, exemption uh, exemption from some FDA drug application fees. What do you think about some of the recommendations that have been offered and what would you uh, offer as well in addition to those recommendations? And Dr. Burgess, I'll, I'll close out that conversation with some thoughts from you as well. Um, at first, I couldn't agree more with Dr. Burgess about the um, lack of training um, when it goes to, it basically goes to the root of the problem. Um, we like if we are working on regulations and approvals, we are comparing AI systems against our human experts. If our human experts are not good at identifying the, the case and creating that, it means that there will be actually uh, a bias, inherent bias there, just as a baseline is not good. So anything in addition to that will be approved, and that won't be good either. So we need more investment in the earlier stages of the ecosystem, in the life of basically um, training, um, 
um, and educating and clinical research and, uh, and all of that. When it comes to CMS and other incentives um, to provide technology for clinical research and also after regula uh, regulatory approvals for market authorization, uh, I believe from my eagle view, the challenge is lack of digitization. If you don't have data, you don't have the basics of what you will have for improving the technology and building technology. So I think having incentives for implementing digital solutions in the centers that can contribute that information will be important. Having incentives, maybe more support for centers who can recruit patients with uh, inclusive basically perspectives, um, diverse backgrounds is important. And it's not just about skin of color. I can tell you there are many, many biases in the system. When it comes to economy level, when it comes to age, when it comes to gender, when it comes to skin color, we need to work hand in hand and address all those biases in the ecosystem where we have digitization, where we have enough clinical research and then hand in hand working with industry partners to bring technology to life. So we just need more of those uh, programs to support. And again, it goes back to our human experts, researchers, scientists in those centers working really, really hard to help these patients. They need more tools. They need more resources. If our doctors don't have time to put a simple data in their EMR, how you can expect them to have the data to build future AI tools? And our doctors are under-resourced. I know this is a very, very important challenge when it comes to quality of life for our doctors. They just need more support. And then that starts from, yes, if it's our mandate, we need to invest in those areas. And it's competing priority, I understand that, but it has to happen. Dr. Burgess, your final thoughts here? Yes. Um, well, you know, when we talk about CMS and we talk about the government, when we look at the Tuskegee experiment, that was government related. So I don't know how much um, some individuals really trust the government when it comes to that. I think clinical research should be on a volunteer basis, wanting to further the advancement of science and not something that is paid for in instance of certain studies, they got free medication or what have you. I think education is a very important of letting people know what it involves. Um, I just heard something today about HDL, um, you know, wasn't, we looked at it always as it was the good cholesterol, but it may not be, you know, when it comes to African-Americans. So until we know all of the information that may affect different genders, I would support the community by possibly um, education, helping people to get to research clinics or research sites and publicizing. I know being in Washington, D.C., we get publications on um, uh, clinical.gov, which clinicalresearch.gov, which anyone who wants to participate in a research can kind of just look it up. Um, but we're fortunate in Washington, D.C. to have a facility like that. And, and But there are other universities and colleges who do a ton of research. And it's just not, it's not communicated there to the community. But I really think that some people would love to participate if they're getting a medication that they would never be able to afford. Um, some of the phase four studies are, they're already FDA approved. They're looking for you know further safety and efficacy. Patients would love to be involved in those. So it just depends on what aspect of clinical research you're talking about. But I don't think you should ignore the minority communities just because of something like the Tuskegee experiment, because a lot of those people are still, some elders are still around who actually remember that. Um, but it's educating um, individuals and also cohort visit, um, con concordant visits with people of color, with physicians of color is very important because then the explanation, the trust is 
is usually there versus someone who's a disconcordant relationship, patient-physician relationship may not understand or may not trust that physician. So that's why we're trying to increase the numbers of minority dermatologists out there because that's those are the patients who trust are going to be concordant relationships. Well, you both have given us uh, a lot to think about, and I feel like we could have a part two to this conversation. I hope we get the chance to do so. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Burgess and Dr. Miriam Sadehi for the conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.